Hi, welcome back to the Grammar Park channel. This is Sharunisha. In this session, we are going to see the part 4 of the Prolap to the Canterbury Tales written by Geoffrey Chaucer. In our previous sessions, we have seen about Chaucer and his introduction about the characters in the prologue up to the pro man. If you want to know the previous session's topic, please see the link below I have given in the description box. And before getting into the continuation, please like, share and subscribe this channel. Among the pilgrims, the remaining characters are a reap, a miller, a summoner, manciple, and pardoner, and myself. Myself in the sense that is nobody, Chaucer, and there were no more persons to describe. Among this last set of pilgrims, first Chaucer describes about the miller. The miller was a bulky fellow for any occasion. He was stout in muscles and bones. It was evident that wherever he went, he carried away the ram, the prize at a wrestling match. In those days, during any matches or any competitions, if they win the game, they will be awarded with a ram. He was short-shouldered and broad chester and there was no door which he could not lift off its hinges, hinges in the sense the joints, or break it with his head. He would easily break any door. So that is what Chaucer comes to say. His beard was as the hair of a sow or a fox, and moreover broad as if it were a spade. He had a wart right on the top of his nose, but in the sense, tumour on the skin, and it was covered by a tuft, tuft in the sense bunch of hair. The bunch of hair was as red as the bristles, which means the stiff coarse hair of a female swine. His nozzles were black and white, and he carried a sword and a small round shield by his side. His mouth was as wide as a great furnace. His mouth is compared to a furnace, and he was a wrangler and buffoon. A person, one who argues noisily, is called as a wrangler. His talk was mostly of sin and liveness. Liveness in the sense that is being indecent. It means he used to talk about being indecent. He knew how to steal corn and take toll thrice. Toll thrice in the sense he will uh, get three times commissions. By God, he had it a thumb of gold. It means he sampled the corn with his thumb. He knew how to make profit out of it. He wore a white coat and a blue hood. He could blow and play upon a bagpipe. Bagpipe is nothing but a tubular wind instrument. By playing this instrument, he brought all the pilgrims out of the town to the pilgrimage. Our next character is the Mansipal, and he was a good-natured man of the inner temple. Inner temple in the sense that is the inns of court. Mansipal is nobody, an officer who purchased victuals for an inn. All buyers of provisions might learn from him to be wise in buying. It means he is wise in buying anything. For whether he paid in cash or brought on credit, he was always so watchful while making a purchase that he made a good bargain. He is a good bargainer. And does it not show the great favor of God that the common sense of an ignorant man should surpass the heap of wisdom of learned men? So this is what the own sayings of uh, Chaucer. He had more than 30 masters who were well versed in law of whom there were a dozen in that inn or temple good enough to be stewards. Stewards is nobody, persons paid to manage others estate of rent and land for any lord living in England to make him lord live by his own property in honour and deathless unless he were mad. But if he lived as frugally, frugally, economically, as it pleased him, he would be helped about by the shire in any legal case that arose against him. And yet, this mansipal could be fool all. Next is the reeve. The reeve or the farm bailiff, he was a slender and irritable man. His beard was shaven as closely as ever it could be. His hair was closely cropped and cut short round the ears, also in front of those of a priest. His legs were long and lean like a staff, staff in the sense stick, and for he, he had no calf. He took good care of his garners and bins, garners in the sense grain storehouses. No accountant could get the better of him. 
well he knew whether there was a drought or rain how much the yield of harvest would be his lot sheep cattle dairy swine horses store and poultry were well entrusted to his care and he was under contract to present the accounts since his lot was but 20 years of age no one could catch him in arrears there was no bailiff no hard man nor any other former servant which did not know of his trickery and deceit deceit in the sense false representation they were as afraid of him as of death his house stood on a heath it means low shrub and was good to look at it was shaded with green trees he could make purchases better than his lord he was in his own way richly stored with goods he could please his lord craftily so that the latter would give it means the lord would give and lend him his goods and earn the thanks and also gowns and hoods in youth he had learned a good handicraft he was a good workman a carpenter this farm bailiff sat upon a good horse which was dappled gray dappled gray in the sense there will be gray spots on the horse and it was called the the horse was called as scott he had put on a long cover coat of dark blue and by his side there hung a rusty sword the farm bailiff of whom the chaucer is speaking has come from norfolk near a town which men called baldishwell he had his gown tucked up under his belt like a friar's and he rode the hindmost of a cavalcade cavalcade in the sense a procession of a person on horseback our next character is the summoner he had a fiery red face as that of a cherub and cherub is an angel who is protecting entrance of garden of eden during those days cherubs were painted in red their faces were painted in red and here his face was the summoner's face was covered with red pimples here his the summoner's face is compared to cherub's painting his eyes were narrow he was as hot and wanton as a sparrow he had black scabby brows it means irregular brows and a thin beard children were afraid to look at his face there was no preparation of mercury lead ointments tartar it means a reddish crust or sediment or tartaric acid oriented creams and borax or brimstone brimstone is nothing but that is sulfur that could cut cleans or cure him of his knobby white welts it means lumpy acne were there on his face and uh, he had uh, taken uh, not such uh, remedies or purged the pimples sitting on his cheeks he loved garlic onions and also leeks leeks are related to the onion plant type and he loved to drink strong red wine as red as blood then he could speak and shout as if he were mad when he was intoxicated he would speak nothing but latin he knew but a few latin terms two or three which he had picked up from some statue no wonder because he had latin he heard latin being spoken all day as you know a man can teach a jay jay in the sense bird to call out better than the pope but whoever could test him in other things all his knowledge would fail if you ask him the question what is the law definitely he would cry that is what mentioned here questio quid juris he was a gentle and kind fellow a better fellow one should not find for a quart of wine he would lend his mistress to a friend for 12 months and excuse him fully yet he could not pluck a finch to leave no feather if he found anywhere a good fellow with a maid he would teach him not to fear about the archdeacon's curse archdeacon's curse is nothing but that they would go to hell the money extorted is all the hell to be feared for the archdeacon's curse he said but as according to chaucer he knew well that he lied in fact each guilty man ought to be afraid of cursing for curse will kill just as absolution saves the soul and also we should be afraid of excommunication it means the heavenly persons or the god will not speak with us thus he had the young people of the diocese diocese a bishop's jurisdiction 
within his power by mere threat in his own way he knew their private wishes and was their confidential adviser he wore a garland set upon his head large as the holy bush upon a stake outside an ale house and a round cake which it was his joke to wield as if it were in, intended for a shield next we shall see the pardoner of rounsewell rounsewell is a hospital in london near charing cross this pardoner is the friend and comrade of summoner he had come straight from the court of rome he sang loudly the song called come hither love to me the summoner repeated the refrain loudly never was the sound of a trumpet half so uproarious as his voice the pardoner had hair as yellow as wax but it hung as smoothly as a hank of flax like thread but his locks hung in small portions his shoulders were overspread with hair that lay thin strip by strip but because of his liveliness of spirits of vanity he wore no hood for it was trussed up in his bag trussed up in the sense secured closely and it seemed to him that he rode in the new style he rode disheveled bareheaded except for his cap he had staring eyes like a hare he had the image of saint veronica saint veronica is a woman who offered a cloth to jesus on his way to crucifixion to wipe his face his ballot lay before him in his lap it was full of pardons which had come straight from rome he had the goat like small voice he had no beard nor should be have any his cheeks were as smooth as if they had been recently shaved but as regards his profession from berwick to ware there was no other such pardoner for in his bag he had a pillow case which he said was the virgin mary's veil virgin mary is the mother of jesus veil is the cover or mask for head he said that he had a fragment of the sail that saint peter had when he went upon to see till jesus christ took hold of him saint peter is the one of the 12 apostles of jesus and he is also one of the first leaders of early church uh, he was crucified in rome under emperor nero he had a cross made of crop and zinc and it was full of stones and in a glass he had pig's bones but when he found a poor person in the country by exhibiting these relics relics in the sense fragments or crafts he got more money in a day than the person could in two months thus with feigned flattery and jests he is a flattery man he made the person and the people his dupes dupes in the sense deceive or tricks but to tell the truth at last he was a noble priest of the church he could read a passage or tell a story but best of all he sang an offertory hymn sentences sung at the collection of arms arms in the sense during the beggings and he knew well that when the song was sung he must preach and he could well polish his tongue to win silver and he knew how to do it therefore he sang so merrily and loudly so through through these uh, tricks he attracted the people and also collected whatever he wanted from the people so with this that chaucer has told us briefly in a few words the rank the dress the number and also the reason why this company had assembled in southwark at the comfortable inn which was called tabard close beside the bell but now it is the time to tell us how they conducted themselves on the first night we they got down at the inn afterwards he will tell us of our of their journey and all the rest of their pilgrimage before telling everything he begs of us in courtesy not to condemn or pronounce to be wrong him as unmannerly if he speak plainly and with no concealings concealing in the sense uh, the activity of keeping something secret and give an account of all their words and dealings using their very words for we know this as well as he that whoever shall tell the story of man he must relate as closely as ever he can every single word if he remembers it however rudely spoken or unfit or else the tale he tells 
will be untrue the things invented and the new words coined he may not spare one although it were his brother he should as well say one word as another christ spoke out plainly in the holy scriptures and according to chaucer there is nothing reproachable here also as plato said whosoever can read him the word should be as cousin to the deed also chaucer praises to forgive him if he neglect the order and the degree and what is due to social position in this tale here that we may know we may know well understand that he is short of wit wit in the sense intelligence and now he talks about chaucer talks about the host and this host gave them a great welcome and everyone was given a seat and the supper was begun and uh, the host served the finest food the wine was strong and it pleased them all to drink heartily and their host was after all a striking man and fit to be a marshal in a hall he was a broad man with bright eyes there was not a worthier citizen in cheapside cheapside is the place and he was bold of speech wise and well instructed and he lacked nothing of manhood he was also a merry man and after supper he entertained them with intelligence and mirth after the chaucer and other pilgrims settled up their bills uh, the host said now sir you are right heartily welcome to me to tell you the truth i never saw this year so merry a company at this inn as now at one and the same time and i knew how i should gladly make you merry i happen to think of a good plan of diversion for you and it will cost you nothing and also the host says you are all going to canterbury god give you the best of luck may the blessed martyr requite your pain and the host says when they are going to the pilgrimage along the road and they are planning to tell the stories and divert themselves for certainly there is little pleasure or fun in riding along the road dumb as stone therefore he will make sport for them as he said first and give them some pleasure and if it pleases them and if they agree to abide by his judgment the host's judgment and to do as the host suggests then tomorrow when they ride along the road he swears by the soul of the, his father who is dead if the pilgrims are not happy during their pilgrimage they can strike the host's head so the host says hold up your hands without any more words now the host calls the pilgrims as sirs and he says now listen to him for their good but do not please regard it scornfully to speak briefly and plain plainly this is the point that each of the pilgrim to shorten their journey should tell two tales as they are on the move and that he means each shall uh, tell two tales as they proceed to canterbury and two more tales on the way back tales of the happenings of the past and he who among them acquits himself the best in this matter or best in the story telling that is to say tells the stories most excellent in matter and most entertaining shall have a supper at the cost of all here in this inn sitting by this post when they come back from canterbury and in order to give them greater pleasure Uh, the host will himself gladly ride with them at his own cost and be their guide anybody who disagrees with the host must pay all that uh, they spend during their journey if they agree to this they should tell him at once or immediately without wasting their time more words and uh, he will then make early arrangements for that so finally the suggestion was accepted by all the pilgrims and gladly they took their oaths or promises and prayed him also that uh, he should please uh, do as he had suggested and be the umpire and judge of their tales and set a supper at a certain price and they shall be ruled in all matters according to his directions thus unanimously and animously in the sense being one mind they submitted to his decision the host's decision thereupon wine was fetched at once immediately and they drank and each retired without further delay in the morning when the day began 
to dawn their host rose and awakened them all like a cock and gathered them together in a flock and then they rode afoot a little more than a walking pace to the watering place of saint thomas saint thomas is the one of the 12 apostles of jesus he is also known as doubting thomas even he doubted jesus in the beginning but later he regretted and believed him there are uh, their host stopped his horse and said sirs listen if it please you you know your agreement and i remind you of it and then he told if they hold the same view that they had lost evening and let uh, let us see who shall tell the first tale and uh, as according to the hope of the host to drink good wine and ale whosoever shall go against his decision shall pay all the expenses of their journey now they draw lots before they proceed further that he who draws the first lot should lead the host says sir knight and my master and my lord now draw the lots for that is my agreement come near my lady prioress and you sir scholar do away with your modesty do not pass begin every man now chaucer describes what happened after drawing the lots now they draw the lots and uh, he explains chaucer explains briefly as what happened and it by chance destiny or accident the truth is that the lot fell upon the night at which everybody was glad and happy and he must tell his tale as it was reasonable according to the terms of the agreement as they have uh, heard there is nothing more than to be said and when this good man saw that it was his turn as one of who was wise and obedient to keep the agreement as we have heard there is nothing more to be said when this good man saw that it was his turn as one who was wise and obedient to keep the agreement by his voluntary consent he said since i shall begin the sport i welcome the result of the lottery in god's name now let us ride and listen to what i say so like that uh, the knight says and at the word they started their journey on the way and in a cheerful style he then began at once to narrate his tale thanks for watching and your patience and this is the end of the chaucer's prologue and let us continue in the remaining topic and before quitting it please like comment share and subscribe this channel love you all